What is going on, New Vision family? Thank you so much for joining us for Online Church today. My name is Nick Person. I get the privilege of being one of the pastors here at New Vision. And again, we are so thankful out of all the places you could be that you're spending some time worshiping with family today. Hopefully you got to be a part of the lighting of the Christmas tree last week here at New Vision. It was truly an amazing time where families and friends and neighbors came and really illuminated the upcoming Christmas. Christmas season. And if you didn't get a chance to be a part, we have plenty going on in the life of New Vision in this Christmas season that you're going to want to be a part of. And one of those things is our Advent devotional waiting here for you. For more information on that or how to be a part of anticipating the wonderful thing that we call Christmas, you can go to newvisionlife.com slash Christmas to find out all the ways that you can get involved and be a part of going and anticipating Christmas. Today, we are kicking off our new Christmas series, Greatest Hits of Christmas, and we are so glad that you are here. As we prepare our hearts to dive into God's Word through song and through the reading of God's Word, let's pray together. Father God, Thank you so much for who you are, and thank you so much that you truly are Emmanuel, God with us. You stepped out of glory. You lived a perfect life to redeem what was lost. And Lord, may we celebrate this season slowly and with anticipation. Lord, we are thankful and excited about what you're going to do and what you're going to continue to do. And we pray all these things in your awesome and amazing name. Amen. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies, with angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King.
you guys can have a seat. And that's what we want to do this Christmas. We want to adore the Lord. You know, there's a song we sing every Christmas called Joy to the World. And uh, and I'll be honest, there were many years where I struggled having joy in Christmas. Because you see, about 12 years ago, Christmas changed for our family when my mom passed away. And for years, I just struggled. I just didn't have much joy in Christmas. And uh, about two years ago, um, I realized it had been 10 years. And it was also ending one of the worst years and for all of us. And I remember that um, that December, I, I wrote this song and uh, it, and I just really, I was really connecting with the humanity of Jesus. And that's what helped restore the joy because I suddenly realized once again that we have a savior that he gets us. He, he understands. Like he probably woke up sore some mornings thinking, man, I really don't want to go walking around today. I was walking around yesterday. <laughs> he had aches and pains. He might've even needed glasses and they probably didn't even have glasses back then. You know, it's probably like, could you at least give me 2020 vision? You know, <laughs> they don't even know what 2020 is, you know, <laughs> but he was a person like, like you and me. And and that's just good to know that uh, he understands. And so this song is about that. It's called, I Need Christmas. I need Christmas this year. Reminding me that Jesus came down here. That he was human just like me Well, I need reason again to say I need peace here on earth I need his joy in this world Like I've never had before I got questions, I got pain, I got struggles that won't seem to go away. I need Christmas, I need Christmas, I need Christmas, I need Christmas. Jesus had problems, and he had family, and sometimes those were one and the same. He had friends and he had betrayers. to know he understands our pain.
remind everyone that Jesus came down here so he could be human like you and like me. He is the reason the same. He gives us a reason to sing. I need Christmas. Yeah. What a great reminder of what's true. We all need Christmas. Christmas. One of my favorite lines is, I'll be Christmas this year. If I miss you on the front end, my name is Nick, and I get the privilege of being one of the pastors here at New Vision. And if you could do me a huge favor, there are still people trickling in. And so if you have a few seats between, a few seats between you and the next person, I know you've been trying to avoid them or making eye contact with them, but I'm going to need you to go ahead and scoot those couple of seats in so people can find a seat. Thank you for having the Christmas spirit. See how I'm kind of passive aggressive in making you do something. And so, go ahead and scoot in so that we have room for all the people that are still coming to be a part of all things New Vision. And for those watching online, we are so glad that you have tuned in and joined our New Vision family. This really is the most wonderful time of year. And really, there are so many things going on in the life of New Vision, but I don't have enough time to tell you about all of them. But I do want to tell you about a few things that I want to make you aware of. And the first is this. As you leave here today, we have Christmas yard signs. And the point of those is to make it easier for you to invite your friends, your neighbors, and even pastor buyers as they pass by your house to come be a part of all things New Vision. You can stick that in your yard. It has our New Vision Christmas website on it so that people can find out more information about all the things going on here at New Vision. And I want to encourage you to take a step, put that in your yard so that you can be a beacon of hope in this Christmas season. We also have invite cards. You can find those at the hub. Go grab a few of those so you can hand them out when you're checking out at Target or with your neighbors or with your friends or with your coworkers. It's a way that you can invite people to come be a part of all things that God is doing in this place. And we want to encourage you to do that. Also in this Christmas season, we have many, many different ways and opportunities to get involved and to stay involved. And what I love is that the different ways and opportunities we have to use our gifts and talents. If you have noticed, doesn't the building look amazing? It just feels like a Hallmark movie. Amen. And so we had, yeah, y'all can clap for that. You can clap for that. We had a group of volunteers come and give their time over the Thanksgiving break to use their gifts of hospitality and decorating to make this place inviting and welcoming for those who are coming for the first time. And maybe you're sitting in the seat and you thought to yourself, man, I don't think I have any gifts or talents that I can use for the glory of God. If you have breath in your lungs, you have something to offer that God can use. And so hopefully in this season, you will step into an opportunity to serve. You can find out all those opportunities where you can serve at newvisionlife.com slash Christmas, and that way you can get involved and you can take a step. I want to go ahead and invite our ushers to begin to make their way down in order to receive as we continue to worship through offering, but as they come down, I want to go ahead and invite Pastor Brady and Pastor Todd Tanner to come on out. Why don't y'all give a round of applause for both of them? Guys, we're glad you're here this morning. I want to take this opportunity just to tell you just a really cool story. Many of you know that we have been uh, working in Laverne with First Baptist La- Laverne in a, in a church revitalization plan now for about six months. But here's the back story uh, to that. Prior to COVID, we got involved with the pastor at First Baptist Laverne, and then uh, he left. With COVID, everything got crazy. And then uh, they re-engaged with us. And they had a new interim pastor. This is Todd Tanner. Todd and I served on staff uh, at First Baptist Hendersville years ago, so we have been good friends for a long time. Todd doesn't have a microphone today because I don't want him to talk. 
He's got stories. Third service. Yeah, yeah, in the third service. Not only did our offices were side by side, we lived right across the street uh, from right. each other. This is his wife, Deborah, just an amazing person, their daughter, Danielle. But Todd just did such a great job at Laverne, and, and walking us through this merger has just been amazing. And so we would not be where we are without your faithful work. So we're so thankful for the work that, that Todd's done. And why this is important, we're getting ready for our Christmas Eve offering. And so as we receive an offering on Christmas Eve, Eve, one of the things that that offering is going to go to is to the work there in Laverne. Uh, we just uh, we just really like to say, hey, for the first year, we're going to pay for just the, the new pastor's new salary for the first year there at Laverne. We think that'd be such a blessing uh, for the church. We have about 50 of our folks who are down there right now serving, so it's just just really cool. So I wanted to bring Todd and Deborah and Danielle out today, and just uh, if you guys would do me a favor, they have worked so hard, done such a good job holding that church together and, and bringing this merger uh, together. Would you just let them know how much you appreciate all their faithful work? Thank you. Let's pray for this offering today. Father, we love you and, and praise you. Thank you for your goodness. And Lord, we thank you for this time of year when we celebrate the hope that we have in Christ. And Lord, even as we have a chance to give today, we realize our giving is a response to, to you giving first everything that we would need and more in Christ. And so today, would you just take uh, this offering, bless it in a powerful way that the the kingdom could be expanded. And Lord, we, we just pray for the work there in Laverne. Uh, Lord, thank you for the faithfulness of of Todd, Lord, and how you've used he and Deborah and Danielle, and I pray that uh, you'd just do immeasurably more than anything we could ask or imagine there. In Jesus' name, amen. to us. 
us abide with us, hallowed guys are here. Those of you watching online, it's great to have you. I love everything about Christmas. I love the music of Christmas. My only problem with it, there's just not enough time for all the great music that there is at Christmas. And I, I know some of you may not be Christmas music folks, but that's on you, not on me. I love everything. And we're, we're going to be taking a deeper dive into some of the greatest hits just of all times of Christmas. We're going to look at this song, A Little Town of Bethlehem. And you might be saying, well, that seems weird to do a sermon series around, around songs. Well, you haven't even heard the first one yet. So, but, but the point in that is there's just a lot of great truth in these songs. We've never really had the time. We've, we maybe sung these songs all of our life, like O Little Town of Bethlehem or maybe Silent Night, A Joy to the World, all these songs. But a lot of times we miss some of the deep truth that's there. So we're going we're gonna to take a deep dive into some of these this, week, or this month. We're super excited about it. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open them up to Matthew chapter 2. And that's... Uh, where we're going to be today, and you'll see how this will come together, hopefully, in just a few moments. Uh, the only thing I don't like about Christmas, I can just say this, it doesn't really fit. The only thing, I love everything about Christmas, big Christmas fan. The only thing I don't like about Christmas is how we so insist on taking young children, nine months, a year old, uh, you know, 18 months, and have their picture made with Santa Claus. I don't understand that. Like they're screaming and, and crying, and we, we've seen pictures. Every year it's the same thing. It just torments children, you know, and I, I just don't get it. Like, and, and, and we seem surprised when they, you know, when they throw a fit. Like here's some big guy with a beard and a freaky red velvet suit, and you know, go to you know, sit in his lap. They've never seen him before. We don't understand why they panic. Don't, don't do that to your kids. I don't think it's healthy at, at Christmas. So here's what we're gonna here's what we're gonna be today. We're gonna talk about this song, "A Little Town of Bethlehem." I, I've, I've entitled this this message "Lessons from Little Big Town." Any of you country music fans here? Okay. Any Little Big Town fans? All right. Yeah, five of you. Not bad. <laughs> but I, I think there are some uh, really some uh, lessons from this little big town. That's Bethlehem, this little big town. You know, we, we think about the Christmas story. There's some great lessons, obviously, from the people around Christmas, which we'll, we'll look at. But there's also some great lessons that really we can learn from the places of Christmas. So we'll, we'll see that today. So let's think about Bethlehem today. Let's jump in. Matthew chapter 2, a passage you're familiar with. But let, let's look at it today because it'll help us understand a little bit more uh, about this uh, little big town. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, now Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience, so when he reminds them that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, they would have instantly gone back to uh, remembering that there was somebody else who was from Bethlehem, and we just finished uh, studying First and Second Samuel, so all of you remember who was from Bethlehem, right? David, six of you. Yeah, King David, uh, Jesse's son, was from Bethlehem. And so Israel's great king, King David, was from Bethlehem. And the long-awaited Messiah, the ultimate king, is from Bethlehem. So Matthew is really expecting his Jewish audience to have kind of a, that makes sense, an aha moment. And Jesus was born during the time of King Herod. Uh, Herod worked for the Romans, but he was ruling and reigning in the nation of Israel, and he saw everybody as a threat. He's a, a very misguided person. It says that Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw its star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now let's stop right there. Uh, first of all, we, we know this story, right? Some of you are like, I've heard this one. I got it. Uh, one of the things that I think it's good to do with your manger scenes this year, if you, if you, if you want to do this, because it'll create some conversation, we, we like to do this, take the wise men and put them on the other side of the room uh, because they weren't at the manger scene. This is, this is probably a year later. It takes them a while to get there. And people ask, what, what, why aren't the wise men here? They're on their way. They're making their way. 
Yeah, that's kind of cheesy, but it'll give you, it'll give you a discussion to do that. Um, but here's the thing. Here, here's secondly, this idea about the wise men, there's a lot there. In the first century, Jews, and in the middle, the early part of the first century with, with, with Jews, and then the middle part of the first century with the first Christians in, in the first church, they had something in common. They had multiple things in common. One of the things that they had in common was their disdain from these uh, magi or people who studied the stars, astronomers. During that, that time, it was like this sort of black magic. And so my point is, if you're here today, if you're watching online, you would say maybe this about the Bible. You say, you know what, I, don't, I, don't, I think the Bible's got some good stories in it, and, and the Bible really teaches us some lessons on how to live life, but I don't believe the Bible is accurate. Now, you're free to think that. You're free to think that. But I would ask you to think about this. If this story was a fable, if it was made up, why in the world would a group of people, first century Christians who had disdain for people who studied the stars, why would they have them as central figures in the story? Like that doesn't make any sense at all unless it's true. My point is the Bible can be trusted, every single word of it. And so it, it leads to the second question, why were these magi from the Persian Empire, 900 miles away from uh, the city of Bethlehem, why were they looking to the stars? What, what were they looking for? And why were they even thinking about that? Well, we have to go back 600 years earlier before uh, Christ was born. And the nation of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, was attacked by the Babylonians. And they took many of the Jews from Jerusalem to the Babylonian Empire. That's where, if you grew up in church, the story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember that? That's that story. And so these ancient Jews would have gone there and they took the scripture with them, the stories, the prophecies of the coming Messiah, a prophecy like Numbers chapter 24, verse 7 that says, a star will come out of Jacob, a scepter, meaning a king, will rise out of Israel. So these, these Persians were uh, looking for this because the scripture had been embedded there some 600 years earlier, which I think is fascinating. Verse 3, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When Herod felt threatened, then everybody was going to have a bad day. Uh, some say it was uh, better to be um, a pig of King Herod's than a family member. He executed children, his children, wives that he had that he thought were conspiring against him. Now it says, verse 4, when he, meaning Herod, called together all the teachers, all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Let's stop for just a moment and think about that. What's Herod doing? He's saying, okay, I'm hearing, we, we, we got this massive entourage of people who've come from 900 miles away, and they're saying that they've followed some sort of prophecy and that there is a king who has been born. So he calls in everybody who knew anything about the ancient scripture and says, do you know anything about this? I mean, where is this quote unquote Messiah supposed to be born? And look at verse five. They answer immediately, they don't have to say, let me get back with you. Like, I'm, I'm not, not really sure. They, they knew the answer. Verse 5, in Bethlehem, in, in Judea, the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem, in this little big town. Bethlehem was about six miles south, or still is, six miles south of Jerusalem. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. And now they quote. Now, they didn't have to Google it. They just quoted the prophecy. They're quoting Micah chapter 5, verse 2, this Old Testament prophet who's talking about the coming Messiah. And here's the prophecy. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. Even though you're a small place, during the time of Jesus, Bethlehem probably only had 300 people. Didn't even have a dollar general back in that day. So you're, you're not least among the rulers of Judah. In other words, God hasn't forgotten about you for out of you will come a ruler. Something great is going to come out of you who will shepherd my people Israel. There is a, there is a king, the ultimate shepherd. I mean, David was a shepherd, but the Messiah is going to be the ultimate shepherd. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Now, why did he do that? As we read on, we won't look at this passage. You read on the rest of, of Matthew chapter 2, Herod is going to go and he is going to murder all of these male uh, children in Bethlehem. It could have been as many as 20, maybe 30 under the age of two because he's trying to eradicate the threat. And one of the things that is super fascinating when you go to Bethlehem, we're going in 2024 with a group from here. When, when you go to Israel, 
um, many times, not every time, many times you, you'll get to go and, and view an, an ossuary, a box of, of ancient bones in the city of Bethlehem that are kept. And why are they kept? These are some of the bones of these infants that were killed during Herod's reign, trying to eradicate this, this threat. So he says, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. He didn't want to worship him. He had a hostile response. After they heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Now let me stop, stop you here. Some of you are like, you've stopped about eight times. Could you just read the story? <laughs> they had been following a star for 900 miles. Those of you who are still awake, that's a long way, isn't it? They get to Jerusalem and they don't see the star. And Jerusalem is the religious epicenter of the ancient world. And they don't see the star. It isn't until after they leave Jerusalem, they again see the star again. So is there a lesson there? I think so. I think sometimes religion blinds people for the truth, from the truth of who Jesus Christ is. I see that all the time. Maybe you grew up like that. You grew up in, in this legalistic religious system and it really kept you from seeing the essence of who Jesus is, his grace, his mercy, his power. You see, and, I, and that is a great fear for me, for me as someone who is a religious leader, that in my life that I would keep people from seeing the truth of who Jesus is. That's what you see in this story. Verse 10, it says, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Here are kingmakers. These are uh, folks who had political uh, power. They had wealth, but when they saw the star again, they were overjoyed. In other words, they had found something that they could not find anywhere else. I wish like anything. It's only the Holy Spirit of God who can take a truth and, and really bury it deep into our heart and life. But if I could say one thing today that I wish you could get, here's what you learn from these magi. They had found something that they couldn't find anywhere else in Jesus. And most of you will have to learn that the hard way. But if you are looking for true joy, contentment, peace, and a satisfaction that you can't find anywhere else, you can only find it in him. He is the ultimate, right? That's what they found. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshiped him. They opened their treasuries and, and presented him with gifts of gold, of frankincense, and myrrh. And we know that, right? I mean, every one of you in this room said, what, what are the gifts that the wise men brought? Most of you could say gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? We, we know that. And that's why we think there were just three wise men. There weren't. The three gifts are very significant gifts, and they are describing something that they knew that this child was. The gift of gold was them saying, you are a king. We're in the presence of the king because the gift of gold is a gift of royalty. Does that make sense? Frankincense says you are a divine king. It was used in worship. The frankincense was burned uh, as the smoke went to heaven. They were saying it's a chance for us to worship you as king. So you are king, but you are a divine king to be worshiped. And then the last gift, myrrh, was used in embalming to say that you are a king who will ultimately die as a human being. So isn't this powerful. These three gifts have great theology and understanding the nature of who the Messiah was. Verse 12, and we'll end here. Not the message, just the reading. <laughs> After being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. God is moving, God is working, and God is protecting. He protected them on 900 mile journey over, very dangerous, and he is protecting them. They're going back another way. He reroutes them. Can I say something to parents here for just a second? Because we just want safety. Don't, I mean, the older, I don't know what it is, to, the older uh, that I get, I, I get more cautious. Anybody like that? I mean, you've kind of seen some things. So we want our kids to be, to be safe. We don't want them to be in any un, un, unsafe places. Can I just tell you something? The safest place for your child to be is in the center of God's will. And I just, I'm saying that because I, I think there's some moms and dads here, and, and we hear this sometimes from college students, maybe that God's calling into ministry, and they're even getting some pushback from their parents, like, you know what, I don't want you to do that because I don't want, you know, God might send you here, God might send you there, or you might not have the financial means, or all these fears that come in. Do you see how God protected these magi? He sends them back another way. The safest place to be is where God would have you to be. That was just free, right? Okay, that's my Christmas gift to you. All right, let's get back to you country music fans. You're like, when is little Big Town going to play? <laughs> no, they're not. They're not. That was all a bait and switch here. Yeah, dang, somebody said, watch your mouth up in here. It's God's house. <laughs> lessons from little Big Town. What are the lessons from little Big Town? Well, the first line 
in the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem, it says, O Little Town of, I'm not going to sing it. I sang a couple weeks ago. I've been bombarded with chances to sing at weddings and bar mitzvahs, and I just don't have the time. <laughs> so I'm not. O Little Town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. So that's how the song starts. Little Town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a little town with big significance. A little town with big significance because little towns really are, are big based on who's from there. Does that make sense? I mean, Bethlehem had less than one half of 1% of the population of Jerusalem. But you go anywhere in the world today, and you mention the city of Bethlehem, and people know Bethlehem. Why do they know Bethlehem? Because who's from there? I, 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 yeah, Jesus, right. Uh, you got it. That's exactly right. I was in Boston several years ago, and, uh, and, and I was just talking. We were at a restaurant, and, and some guy said, you're not from here, are you? That was my best Boston. I don't know. I said, I'm, I'm not. He said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, loud and proud. He said, that's the home of David Price. That's right, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. At that time, he was pitching for the Boston Red Sox, home of David Price. And he said, Tennessee, the home of Elvis Presley. Yeah, 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 he's, yeah. Actually, it's Tupelo, Mississippi, where Elvis was. I didn't want to tell him that, but yeah, he lived in it. <laughs> Anyways, but isn't that true? That's how people know a place, by who's, who's from there. All right, let's try this. Anybody know Kentwood, Louisiana? Anybody know who's, Kent, who's from Kentwood, Kentwood, Louisiana? All right, we're going to tell you right here. Britney Spears, home of Kentwood, Louisiana. Some of you are like, okay, all right, yeah. Did you get that in the back? I saw somebody's hand go up. Way to go, Britney fan. Good deal. <laughs> all right. Hamburg, Arkansas. Hamburg, Arkansas. Anybody know who's from Hamburg, Arkansas? Nobody. It's awkward. Scotty Pippen. Scotty Pippen. Isn't that good? You ever been, you read traveling, you go through these little towns, you see the green, don't you always, you want to read the green sign, don't you? You just tell who, who's from there. I, I didn't know they were from there. Chicota, I don't know if I'm saying it right, Oklahoma. Chicota, Oklahoma. Carrie Underwood, right? I mean, you know, that's, that's how that place is, is known. Wakapaneta, Ohio. Anybody know this one? This is a Neil Armstrong, exactly right, right? See, so that's what makes these little towns have big significance because who is from there, who resides there? We know that's true, don't we? Certainly true in Bethlehem. And you think, well, okay, thanks for the last five minutes on the history lesson. I needed to know where Britney Spears was from. <laughs> Bethlehem's significance can be yours. Let me say that to you again. What made Bethlehem significant is who was born there. And what makes you significant is who has been born in you if you're in Christ, who resides in you. Does that make sense? I'm not just saying. I mean, that's true. I mean, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27, the prophet Ezekiel prophesying about the day that we live in today. It says, I will put my spirit within you. Do you understand this? The moment that you turn from living for yourself in repentance and trust Christ as Savior and Lord, the very Holy Spirit of God resides in you. Do you believe that? It's true, isn't it? You know what that does? That gives you significance, right? Because of who resides here. I'm significant because who resides within me. Not because of anything I've done, what I have or what I, I don't have. And that is never going to change. And I'm telling you something. That's something you can build your life on. Doesn't that make sense? Because we're so up and down. I mean, some of you here today, you feel forgotten. You know, maybe, maybe in, in, in school... Maybe there's some who get more attention because of the way they look or academics. Maybe in your career, you've never really gotten to the spot you'd hoped to be, and you just feel forgotten, and you feel insignificant. Listen, significance is based on who resides within you. You see, all the people in the story, the central figures in this story were, from a culture standpoint, insignificant people. The magi, they dabbled in, in, in black magic. At least the church thought that. There's an unmarried couple that everybody was whispering about. I mean, there's shepherds who show up who are on the low end of the social economic totem pole, but they all get significance because of who would come to reside within them. And so the question that I think it leads is this. Am I drawing, this is a great lesson from Bethlehem. Am I drawing my worth from what I've done or whose I am? Listen, if you draw your worth from the former, you will be frustrated most of your life. But if you draw your worth from the latter, it's a life that you can build off of. Now, the second line in the song, a little town of Bethlehem, 
how still we see thee lie. Here's the second line. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. You ever hear sometimes people talk about a town, they'll say it's a sleepy little town. You've heard that? Not much going on, right? And, and we're going to see in this story, one of the lessons from Bethlehem is significance, a truly significant life, the life that you're looking for is a byproduct more of stillness than activity. I mean, God could have chosen Jerusalem for his son to be born in, but he didn't. There was more activity there, but he chooses, if you will, a sleepy little town. God could have chosen Rome, but he didn't. He chose a sleepy little town. So could it be that there is a lesson there for us? Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15 says, This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. Watch this. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness... And trust is your strength. But then this, this last line is a line for us, but you would have none of it. Our culture today gives value to busy people. Our culture validates busy people, don't they? I mean, we talk about that. How's your week? Oh, man, crazy. And basically what you want people to say is, wow, nice. You got it going on. You have got it going on. Right? That's our culture. We all agree. And I understand we have to work hard. There's things that going on, uh, going on. But listen. God values things differently, to be still in his presence, to capture the majesty of the moment, to not miss it in the busyness of all that's going on around us. Look at verse 18, Isaiah 30, verse 18. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. Again, I, I think that's what's going on here. I think that's why Christmas after Christmas, we just miss it. Because isn't it interesting? Wouldn't we say this is the busiest time of the year? Is that true for you? I've had four meals this week at the church. I'm going for five uh, tonight. Because there's just something going on all the time. And could it be that the business of this season is just the enemy's plan for us, just to be busy and miss the majesty of the moment? You know, I, I'm, I want to work on this for me. I, I want a significant life. I don't want to miss the majesty. I, I want to understand that one of the lessons from Bethlehem is stillness. You see, Bethlehem is still, but God's not still in this story. Think about it a little bit. God is, is moving. God moves Rome to have a census, which moves Mary and Joseph from Nazareth to Bethlehem. God moves the stars to move the Magi some 900 miles uh, to Bethlehem. In fact, God moves, moves Daniel and other Jews 600 years earlier from Jerusalem to Babylon to impart this truth here. God is moving all around. And I want to say something to you that I hope is an encouragement because I've got to be honest, it's an encouragement to me. And if it doesn't help anybody else, it's going to help me. Right now, you may feel like, God, where are you? You may feel alone. There's a difficult circumstance and situation in your life, and you, it may feel like that God is silent. But God is working while you're waiting right now, I promise you. He's working while you're waiting. That's what we see in this story. He's doing things that you could never do. He's orchestrating in events that you could never orchestrate. Don't you see it in this story? All the things that God is doing. So what do we do in response? Look at Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Do you believe that? God will fight for you. How are you and how am I going to carve out just a little more stillness this Christmas? Because when you think about the little town of Bethlehem, little big town, one of the things you see is a still place and God shows up in stillness. And he will show up in your life if you carve out some time for him. I know this is going to sound weird and you'll think less of me, but that's okay. We've just done some things this year, and we've just scheduled nights because my calendar, like yours, can be full. We've just scheduled some nights over Christmas that uh, we're booked, and the only thing we're doing is being still. Cutting everything off and just trying to spend time in the presence of the Lord and just be still, just turn it down just a little bit, and saying no to some good things so we might experience the best thing. Do you see that? How can I carve out just a little more stillness this Christmas? So let's think about where we've been. Little big town. Little town, big significance. Because who's from there? And the stillness that we learned from there. Little big town, it's a, it's a little town, but a big promise. 
Let's look at the, the I think it's the fourth line. It says, it says this, yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light, meaning something's happening in the darkness of Bethlehem, in these still quiet streets, something erupts, an everlasting life. What is it? It's the light of the world. It's what every Hebrew was looking forward to, that one day God would redeem, one day God would send a Savior, and one day hope would come. That is God's promise. We see that promise all the way back in Numbers chapter 24. That's what the Magi were looking at. We see that promise in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. In fact, there are over 100 promises in Scripture in the Old Testament pointing to the coming of this Messiah, his life, his death, and even resurrection. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. Another promise. We didn't touch on this, which we should have. Shame on me when we were going through First and Second Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7, God lays out the Davidic covenant to King David. He's making a promise. A covenant's a promise. And God says to David that here's what I'm going to do. I am going to do something significant in you. And in fact, your line is never going to, to end. The long-awaited king is going to come from your family line. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. God speaking to David. He said, David, your house and your kingdom will endure forever. How is, how is David's kingdom going to endure forever? David died because a descendant of King David would be Joseph, right? The earthly father of Jesus. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever. Before me, your throne will be established forever. So what does Bethlehem remind us? This is so important. Bethlehem reminds us that God always keeps his promises. Do you believe that? I think one of the secrets to life is learning to trust in the promises of God because God's track record on promise keeping is perfect. And I need that. Our God keeps his promise. He's he's doing that in this story. In fact, think about this. Even the city, Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, which the scripture prophesied that he would be born there, Mary and Joseph maybe were only going to be there a night or two, just to be there and register and then head back to Nazareth. But in God's sovereignty, he keeps his promise there, and he'll keep his promises to you. Let's let's look at a couple promises. I I think claiming the promises of God are really the secret to life. Look at Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Look at this, it's a great promise. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Is that a good promise? Is that a good promise? And one of the reasons why we we struggle with so much anxiety, fear, is we forget the promises of God, that he is with us. He's not, Scripture says he's not going to leave us or forsake us, but he is going to uphold us with his righteous right hand. Is that a good promise? Bethlehem reminds us that God is a what? Promise keeper. So the promises of Scripture, those are true for us. John chapter 3, verse 36, and there are hundreds of these, but I want to share this one. It says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Is that a great promise? To place all of your faith and trust in Christ, you have eternal life. Do you believe that? That's a great promise, isn't it? But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. You say, well, why in the world are you sharing this? Because I want to make this point. And... I've just been wrestling with it. Have you ever heard people say this? And I've said it. Eternal life starts the moment that you trust Christ. Have you you heard that? I think it's true. Nobody? You heard that? The moment you trust Christ, eternal life starts, meaning a whole new way of living. You now, not just your eternity has been impacted, but you have the power of God to, to break free from sin in your life that you never had before. Isn't that good? So eternal life begins the moment. I'm going somewhere with this. Some of you are like, it's Christmas. But that, 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 the promise of that, let, 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 let me read that. Can we take that scripture? Can you put the scripture back up? John chapter 3, verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. We agree. But we never talk about the second part of this. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Eternal life begins the moment you trust Christ, but the opposite is also true. You continue to reject Jesus as king, And hell begins in that moment. What is hell? Separation from God. Not able to experience God's power in your heart and in your life. Both of those things are true. Let's give one more promise and then we'll move on. John chapter 14. I love it. It's my favorite chapter in the entire Bible. I'll use it in about three or four hours. We'll gather back in this room for a funeral of a friend here that we just love, John Dehoda. He's made such a difference in so many of our lives. And so we'll look at this passage tonight at his service. 
John chapter 14, Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms. That's a promise. God's got a room with your name on it. Is that a good promise? I like it. Yeah. If that were not so, I would have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. God's promises are always better than ours. When Jesus said, I've, I've, I've shared this hundreds of times. When Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place, in the, in the Greek, it's a continuing act of preparation. Over 2,000 years, God's been preparing a place for you. Does that get anybody excited here? God created everything that we see in six days. Wow. I'm going to prepare a place. And then he says, I'll come back to take you so that you may be where I am. Here's a promise. Jesus is coming back again. He's going to come back in death to bring me to him, or he may come back soon. As sure as his first coming, we have a promise of his second coming. Do you believe that? And, 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 and so how do you feel about that? Does that excite you, or does that breed some fear in your life? That will tell you something. So let's look at this question before we close up today. Are you looking merely at your present situation, jobs, relationship, the dysfunction maybe of family, or are you really looking at the promises of God? And Bethlehem reminds us, this little big town reminds us that God always keeps his promises. That's such a heartbeat of Christmas. Now, let's look at the, let's look at the third and final thing, right? Little, little town, Bethlehem, but big decision. Because there's, there's a line in this song, A Little Town of Bethlehem. We, we have sung this song all our life, at least I have. And there's a line in there, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. You ever sang that and thought, what in the heck? <laughs> like, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. I mean, that rhymes. It's cool, but what does it mean? Well, it's powerful. It means a lot. It says when it comes to Jesus, Jesus is either going to meet your greatest hopes or he will be the object of your greatest fear just depends on what you will do with him. Because Bethlehem is the birthplace, birthplace, easy for me to say, of the big three. And you say, what in the world are you talking about? In this story, Bethlehem is the birthplace of the big three. Big three what? The big three responses to Jesus. The big three decisions that people will make with Jesus, and I think they are the only three decisions that we can make when it comes to Jesus. They're either, you're either going to have a hostile decision. Who had a hostile decision towards Jesus? Herod. You're going to worship him, that's the Magi, or you will just be indifferent to him. That's all the religious leaders. Think about this for just a moment. I know it's almost time to go, but can you watch this for just a moment? When Herod asked all these people that knew the Scripture so deeply, where would the Messiah be born? They answered it very quickly. Where? Bethlehem, right? It was only six miles away. Yet none of them took the time to even go and check it out. They knew it here, but they're just indifferent. And you say, what's the point? I think those are the only three responses to Jesus. You'll either have a hostile response, and, and I kind of get a hostile response. Here's the deal. Please listen, and this may offend. This may offend, but I, I, it's true. People don't reject Jesus because of lack of evidence. There is so much evidence to validate the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you want to take the time to study the Scripture, it is there. People reject Jesus on, an, on this issue, an issue of authority, meaning this, if Jesus is king, guess what? I am not. And Herod got that. Herod got I just wish in our culture today we would just call it what it is. It isn't for lack of evidence. It's, it's, it's for an authority issue, a hostile response. Jesus is king. Herod says, I want to be king. So he has a hostile response. The wise men, what do they do? They worship. They bow and surrender to the one greater to them. But watch this. Here's the truth. Here's this third group that we don't talk about very much. And I think the church, if I could just be honest today, it's full of just spiritual indifference. Spiritual indifference makes Jesus merely kind of a part of our lives. Can I tell you something about Jesus, please? Jesus never came to be a part of your life. He came to be your life. That's a big difference, right? C.S. Lewis said this. It's an amazing quote. He says, Christianity, if it's false, is of no importance. But if it's true, 
if God really did become a man in Christ, if he really did live a sinless life and die a sacrificial death and was raised victorious over sin and death, he says it's of infinite importance. The only thing that Christianity cannot be is moderately important. It's one of the big three. I think it's the most pervasive in the South. It's exactly what we see in this story with a group of people who knew exactly where Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem, yet it made no implication on their life. They wouldn't even walk six miles down the road to check it out. Spiritual indifference is seen in just spiritual passivity. Inconsistent in worshiping, no desire to necessarily serve or expand the kingdom, no real passion for Christ. Like if it's convenient, then that's spiritual indifference. Like hostility, having a hostile response for me is, is logical. It makes sense because we're born thinking we're king. But spiritual indifference, if we know the truth of who Jesus is, it's, it's illogical, isn't it? It's illogical. Let me share this last, one of the last lines in the song, and I want to close with this. One of the last verses says, And praise and sing to God the King and peace to men on earth. Now, when it comes to Christmas, this is what you'll hear all, all month long. You'll hear it from the church. Jesus came to bring peace on earth. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Jesus didn't come to bring peace on earth. First of all, Jesus came to bring peace between heaven and earth. That is a big, big difference. What does that mean? Here's what it means. I was an enemy to God because of my sin. Does that make sense? I know we don't like to talk about that. I lived for myself. I chose me over him with a hostile response. I was his enemy. I was dead in my sin. And because of Christ, God came to the earth in Christ to bring peace between heaven and earth so that I could be in relationship with him and you too. And only when there is peace between heaven and earth can there even be any chance of being peace on earth. But we skip the most important step. Does that make sense? That's what Christmas is about. The only ones who will stand in God's peace of the big three are those who bow in worship. Of the three, hostility, indifference, or worship. Which one are you? Father, thank you for this moment in time. Thank you for the amazing truths found in your word that point us to our only hope in Christ. And now through the power of your Holy Spirit, would you speak to your people? God, could we be reminded some big lessons from this little town that we are significant not because of what we have done, but because of who dwells within us. God, can you remind us that you always keep your promises? And Father, today, we see that Bethlehem is the birthplace of the big three, and we're going to find ourselves there. And one of those responses, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would you reveal it to us? In Jesus' name, amen. amen. What an encouraging word that we heard about the little town of Bethlehem. What I loved about this message is no matter that Bethlehem was small, what made it significant was the king that was born there, the true king. And I also love, as we had finished the series going through Unlikely, we see that David was a king. He was a forerunner of Jesus, but then the perfect king came to us and was born in Bethlehem. Based on today's message, there probably is a next step for you. Maybe this is the first you've heard of this king that came to be and that was born in the manger and these wise men came to celebrate this king. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you haven't recognized Jesus as the king. We would love for you to step into that and to be obedient to whatever next step you need to take. You can either call or text the number that will be on the screen and we would love to walk with you in whatever next step that you have. 
Know that we at New Vision are for you, we love you, and we are so thankful that you have taken the time to be a part of what's going on online. We would always like to invite you on campus to be a part of what's going on here, but know that you are loved and we're for you.
stoke the fire, fan the flame, Holy Spirit, have your When 